Welcome back. Uh, residents of Weija uh, are uh, lamenting the inability of the authorities there to deal with issues relating to perennial flooding, which they say is affecting uh, those uh, who commute on the Accra Cape Coast Highway. My colleague Max Olababa was in the community, and here's what they find, found out. Heavy rains on the 23rd May last year rendered about a kilometer of the Kaswa Accra Road completely unmotorable. Two articulated tracks were stuck in the silt dumped on the road. A driver of one of the tracks, Issa Halidu, said he was forced to spend the night in his car. We tried to move, we couldn't. We couldn't move. That is why we got all the tanks and the tides. Yeah. Everything is sinking. Yeah. So we don't know how to do unless they help us. Okay. They come to our aid. Otherwise, okay. we don't know what to do. Okay. We, I even get some shovel. You see what we are doing? Yeah. We tried, but mm. it's, not good. it's just some minutes after slight rainfall here in the Wage and Barrow municipality. What you can see um, is rainwater gushing down from upstream from the hill um, here at Wage. Washes down silt onto the main road, reducing a three lane stretch to one, sometimes two. Many motorists are complaining about the situation. They want authorities to fix the perennial problem. It rained for only 15 minutes on Wednesday. Some parts of the road is already flooded with a massive gridlock. I've met a resident, Kingsford Kojufusu. He's very angry about the situation. Very, very, very bad. Very, very, very bad. And, and, and we are facing a lot of problems. We share traffic. We share traffic. We see from... You guys for say sound give you. Make them know say we do suffer for this road top. We do suffer. Some block actually two days here. Anytime it go rain, then to them go drop them water. Now, if I can't say, ah, bro, we do suffer. We do suffer for a year. It'd be bad. Today, yo, every rainfall, even, even, even small drop, this road go full. I don't know. This road be government's road. Make I ask you. Yeah, yeah. It be government's road. Where government knows say this road there, yeah? yeah. Government people, they pass here, then they use the road. Yeah. You know, good. Visibly angry motorists who couldn't step out of the cars to speak to us had something to say to city authorities. Anytime it rains, it gets flooded here. Please get them to fix it for us. A man seated in a commercial vehicle blurted out as the car moved through the flat water on the road. Emmanuel Fouri is a taxi driver. He says anytime it rains, drivers are compelled to spend productive hours in traffic on the bridge at Akala stretch. He wants city authorities to fix the challenge. It causes traffic. Yeah. Whenever it rains, excessively, all the, the high land and the low land mm. at the top, it pushes the soil, so it causes soil erosion. Mm. So it makes our work so difficult. Mm. I want them to drill a hole, like a gutter, so that the water can flow. To me, you know, it, it delay my work. Whenever there's excessive traffic, the fuel is always congeal, yeah, so it makes our work difficult. Yeah. It's not only motorists who are affected by the flooded road. Some businesses here have lost thousands of Ghana cities as a result of the situation. Nanama Boy is the manager of the Wager branch of Atala Limited. It has destroyed some of our tile cement, our main cement, our slate, and a lot of our books sometimes when we are at the downstairs. So it has really struck. So I want the authorities um, to come and ask about how the situation will be solved because I see that this issue is not about a one person issue. It's a very tough, it, and I learned it's coming from the top. It rains, today that it's flat, uh, it rains here. Yeah. It's just a little rain, no? it's like drizzling, not really rains, but it was, all this place was flooded. A resident, Martin Luther King Agbeve says, a permanent solution is needed since the problem has become perennial. This is the big gutter here. This is the big gutter connected to 
the West is more here. Then descend to the main entrance, to the traffic lights. And then when it rains like this, the flood is very huge. We talk to the authorities. They said they will do something about it. We are waiting for them so many years. NDC come, nothing. MPP come, nothing. So people are dying. It costs traffic a lot. A lot. People are able to go to work and the time also to, yeah, it's going. So he, he, the, the road to is spoiling the road, the rushing. So they have to do something. And so city authorities fix the perennial flooding on the Tala section of the road at Wager. More productive hours will be lost to the congestion that is created anytime it rains. The road is already showing signs of deterioration as a result of the flooding. Maxwell Agwagba for Joy News. Well, let's stay on this because uh, the National Disaster Management Organization, NATMO, is warning Ghanaians, um, especially those uh, in the national capital, to be cautious as the rain setting uh, due to issues of perennial flooding. Joining us now is George A.C., Communications Director for the National Disaster Management Organization. Uh, Dr. Joel Asiedu is a researcher, senior lecturer at the University of Cape Coast. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Uh, George, not a good time. Of course, a uh, lot of residents uh, within Wager here in the national capital as well uh, are waiting on authorities to deal with the potential threats ahead of the downpours that we're expecting. Uh, why are you not acting? George, you'd have to unmute so we can we can hear the point you're making. Yeah, good evening to you and, and your viewers. Uh, yes, I remember about two years ago almost, uh, Joy and uh, your sister station, Adum, we had a discussion around the Atawa area uh, with the MP, the English Yaman from MP Sylvester. Uh, 30. And, you know, this issue came up and, you know, he had said he was engaging the Ghana highways and then the Ministry of Works and Housing. And as, as the uh, residents were saying, it's a major issue, a major uh, construction issue that must be taken up by the Ministry of uh, Works and Housing in partnership with the Ghana Highway Authority uh, to be able to, one, scoop all the sun that are washed down to the roads, onto the roads, I remember the DC said he was using his budget to do that work. And, and you know, the auditors cautioned him not to uh, do that again. And so that was a challenge. And so where Ghana Highways Authority was to do that. Uh, as to how it's not started, as I said, it's a major construction work and is above the National Disaster Management Organization. It is a major work at the Ministry of Works and Housing and Ghana Highway Authority. Well, I'm asking the question because you've issued a statement uh, cautioning uh, residents uh, to, to be wary of the flooding situation in, in, in the capital and beyond. Um, so what's your expectation of the general public? Yeah, we, we expect the general public, especially those living in such areas, flood prone areas, to be careful, uh, to be cautious uh, in going about their duties, especially when they know uh, during these times, uh, these are major challenges that uh, confront them so that they wouldn't find themselves in uh, precarious or dangerous situations where the waters can scoop some of them away. Again, uh, the issues of uh, flooding and electrocution, we, we caution them that uh, make sure if you're in the flood prone areas, uh, switch off all your electrical gadgets, especially when you see the clouds forming and, and it's going to rain. And then we spoke about the need for all of us uh, to pay heed to what the weather warnings by the Ghana Meteorological uh, Authority so we will know what to do uh, and not be overtaken by events. Mm. And what are you doing in conjunction with the meteor uh, agency? Uh, is it that you're predicting more rain, a reason for which you're putting out this caution? Yes, they've told us that Meteo now we work in partnership with them in the weather warning informers and when the rains are about to set in we have a, a collaborative engagement and they tell us that they give really something like a timetable mm. mm. and, and the warning for about half a year so we, we we get 
uh, an insight into how the rainfall pattern and situation is going to be. Uh, and that sets us to get a gauge between the public and, and especially those in flood prone areas to be cautious of how they go about the activity. So we are working in partnership with the Ghana Metro. Right. Uh, Very finally, is there any platform you've created for residents here in Accra to reach out? Can you come again? Have you created a platform, uh, an emergency response system, uh, for which people um, who are stranded could reach no. out? Mm. Uh, it's a normal emergency line one one two. Uh, that's what. Can you hear me? Yes, loud uh, and clear. Normal emergency line one one two. Yes, one one two. That uh, we entreat people to call for emergency purposes when it goes there and is a disaster issue to be relayed to the national disaster management mm. organization, mm. and we will dispatch our uh, operations and search and rescue team to go and assist them. All right, then. Uh, George AC joining as uh, communications director. Uh, for the uh, National Disaster Management Organization. Dr. Joel Asir is still with us. Uh, and Doc, um, uh, the traits and the nature of the floods this time around appear to be very intense. Uh, what's your research pointing to on this? Um, it is flooding issue. Um, I did some work um, a few years back, but that was the um, work for my PhD. And the main finding was that um, the you know, urbanization is creating a lot of impervious surfaces, okay? From roofs, from paved pavements and other places, even from bare surfaces, which have been compacted due to regular use and others. Uh, so from the research, what came out was that about two thirds of the water that accumulates and eventually cause floods in our communities originates from the roofs of our buildings. Okay. And so um, if, if we could have a system in place, the policy should direct retainment of water at the plot level. It was going to take away one third of this major problem. And of course, there are other interventions which must also go alongside it. Okay. So this was the main thing that came out of the research. And really, if you look at the trends over the years, you could see that um, there is a lot of logic in that because there is a lot of truth, if I should say, in that because you see this flooding situation continue to worsen, although government is making efforts to construct storm drains and others. The main thing is that we have a situation where, due to urbanization, we have removed all the places of, we call them places of attenuation, places where normally runoffs will infiltrate into the ground. We have removed all such places and we have concretized such places. So now, even in people's homes, apart from the roof, you see that they decide to tile the entire space outside the building. And so you have runoff generated from the roof and then from outside the building, running onto the street, into the gardens, which have not been made to accommodate so much rainfall. And so within a very short time, you have so much volume coming in and then overwhelming the system and it ends up flooding the system. So the first thing that my re the research showed was that if you will target retainment at the plot level, which interestingly, our building code has also stipulated, except that it is not very specific. It's not targeted, actually. Okay, the building code says that after your development, the amount of runoff that you generate from your plot should not be more than what it was before you decided to put up the building or decided to put up whatever development that you were doing there. Okay, but of course, this is not being adhered to. But if you will target and say that this thing needs to be implemented wholesale at the plot level as one of the major tools to retain storm water, to reduce the problem of flooding in our communities, then um, I think maybe people will take it more seriously. So this is what came out of, out of the research. How about uh, city planning and um, issues of policy and just to address this? Is that not crucial? Okay. Yes. It, the issue of policy is very important because we need a policy that would ensure that people are doing this. And then we have laws coming in to enforce this thing. Okay. And then the planning also has an aspect because just like the gentleman was saying, 
um, in the Jerusalem SEC area, you have a lot of runoff coming from the hill, uphill area. And of course, combined with uh, uh, runoff from impervious surfaces, uh, it ends up coming that, bringing down a lot of sediments and it will cause the obstruction as we, we have been witnessing on our road. And so it is not only containment at the plot level, we should stop destroying the natural places of attenuation. Nature has provided natural sumps through which storm water will infiltrate into the ground. And also we have vegetated areas which will also help to reduce the impact of the rainfall to allow for infiltration. And if you are taking off all these green areas, then of course the water will come and it will be running like we have been seeing and no amount of storm drains constructed will address the problem. So it's going to be, it must be a wholesale uh, um, solution. The first one I believe is at the plot level. And then these other green areas which must be retained, protected and enhanced should also be added to the list. Yeah, that's why I'm asking about policy because that's, that's crucial. Uh, where should the policy target? Yeah, the policy should target storm water retainment at the plot level. In fact, from the, the, the building code 2018, it states that you should not allow more than 95% of the water that you generate from your plot to escape the plot. But this is not being implemented. So like I said earlier, you go to places where people have decided to tile every space outside their building. And so it means in effect that you have more than 95% of the water they are generating from the, the plot coming out and entering the public drains and causing problems. Uh -huh. So this policy, this should be a policy that should be enforced, that you will retain not less than 95% of the water that you generate on your site, on site. And this is one of the ways that can be done. Mm. In fact, there are, there are places where uh, the plots may not have enough space, but there are other places where the plots, the building, there are enough space to accommodate, accommodate this. And this is what I suggest to most of my clients, that harvest rainwater, harvest rainwater on site. So you can either build an underground receptacle or you buy polytanks if you have the space. So you buy these polytanks or underground um, concrete structures to harvest the rainwater, store it. And this is not only helping, going to help to reduce the amount of water that eventually comes out, but it is going to also provide water for you so that you are less reliant on the public um, uh, portable water source. So that if there is a cut, if there is a, uh, the taps are not flowing, you are not worried. In fact, in my house, that is what I do. I harvest about 90% about of the rainfall from my, uh, from my site. And so I retain it in my receptacle, and that is what I use for day-to-day -day, uh, running of the house. Of course, it is it, due to pollution, high levels of pollution, one cannot drink such, uh, such, uh, from such source. So uh, provision is made. I, for one, I buy water from outside mm -hmm. to drink. Mm -hmm. But for washing, for cooking, and other uh, uses in the, at, the, at the domestic level, um, the water that is stored in the tank is good enough. And that right. is what we have been using. Mm -hmm. and Dr. That is Joel what I'm Asiedu, thank you. I, I'm grateful that you've been able to uh, share this insight uh, with us. You're watching. <laughs>